Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the February 2023 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of Lesson 4, Democratic Centralism and the Committee System from Activist Study, Arlang Octobista, by the Communist Party of the Philippines. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this is lesson four from activist study, Arlang Octobista. This is considered prerequisite work. You have to do this first before you can go on to the more advanced programs within the Communist Party of the Philippines. So take these lessons, learn them well. There are four in total. We've already put up Lessons 1 through 3 on the channel as separate audiobooks. After we finish this, we will edit them all into one video and upload that as well. But these lessons are considered foundational, so you really should learn them as well as you can. All right, let's begin. Lesson 4, Democratic Centralism and the Committee System. A. Democratic Centralism. 1. What is an organization, and why is it important? An organization is a system that groups people together to stand and act as one effective force. It binds members and parts to move as one in advancing one unified goal. It is through an organization and organized action that a unity based in one's spirit and zeal can have a concrete form of expression. As a system, an organization has strong principles that guide its members on how to think and act. It has its own set of rules and objectives that is mirrored by its system of leadership with different levels of responsibility. These are necessary elements that make it certain the organization marches to one drumbeat and cadence in achieving its goal. We can compare the organization to a broom that gets its strength when we tie its fronds together. If the fronds are separate, it is weak and can easily be broken. But if tied together, it becomes an effective tool to clean dirt. 2. What is a revolutionary organization? Why is it important? An organization is classified as revolutionary if it promotes the interest of the broad masses. It is intent on struggling to free the people from exploitation towards genuine change in society. The history of Philippine society is full of experiences of Filipinos forming different organizations to forward their revolutionary struggle. For example, the Katipunan was formed in 1896 as an armed force or army of the people in their fight against Spanish colonial rule. At present, there is the Communist Party of the Philippines, the New People's Army, and various mass organizations in different corners of the country that are struggling to achieve national freedom and genuine democracy. In contrast, there are different organizations built by the enemy. These reactionary organizations are bent to cuddle and cater to the interest of the exploitative and oppressive classes. The enemy wants to maintain the present status of society, where only a few get the benefits of the land. Direct and indirect methods are used to deceive and oppress the people. There are the AFP, the Barrio Councils, and bogus cooperatives. Not only do these favor the enemy, but they also make sure that the toiling masses are fragmented. The enemy utilizes the divide-and-conquer tactic to dismantle the formation of our unity. This is the reason why the ruling class, who are few in number, can control the majority of the Filipino people. As long as we are fragmented, we are not going to be effective in fighting the exploitation, oppression, and domination of the ruling class. But if we are organized and have strong unity, then like a broom, we can remove the dirt and problems of our society. The strength of our unity is the only force that the majority of the oppressed Filipino use in its fight against the powerful enemy. This is the reason why it is our responsibility to form revolutionary organizations, so that our unity and struggle can continuously flow. We must always make sure that we augment and strengthen our roles and excel in binding and mobilizing our forces. It is only through this that we can concretize the majority of the strength and power of the exploited and oppressed classes to overthrow their class enemies and build a democratic and free Philippines. Being a member of a revolutionary mass organization is voluntary. Membership means being determined and committed in the cause of the organization and consciously embracing the principles, policies, and decisions of the organization. 3. What is democratic centralism? Democratic centralism is the principle that guides us in forming and making our organization work. This ensures that we are going to act as one unified organization. Democratic centralism means that the centralism is based on democracy, and democracy guided by centralized leadership. 
Centralism that is based on democracy means that all must give emphasis to the general interest of the organization. An effective organization draws its strength from the active participation of all its members and parts. The decisions held inside the organization are collectively discussed based on the overall interest of the group. Democracy that is guided by centralized leadership means that the individual interest in action is subordinate and agrees to the overall interests and goals of the organization. The decision of the organization is tightly followed, and everybody is free in working towards the interests and goals of the organization. The overall essence of centralism depends on the strong commitment of each member to the principles and objectives of the organization that unify the whole membership. Involved discipline of members stems from this. This is essential to the success of the organization. On the other hand, democracy means the involvement of members in forming and upholding and working on the decisions, and the conscious effort of each member in pushing and working in their roles and rights as members of such an organization. The principle of democratic centralism makes it clear to us how we can have a vibrant and efficient way to struggle. As a result, we are able to make right decisions, plans and programs, and know how to make it work. Following democratic centralism also assures us that our organization will remain strong, despite all the efforts of the enemy to destroy it. Living and embodying the principles of democratic centralism is important to a sure and organized way of carrying our revolution towards victory. At its core, democratic centralism is strictly upholding the basic principles and implementing the policies and decisions of the organization. This is the primary way that it ensures the unity in thought and action of all members. 4. What are the basic conditions for establishing democratic centralism? We need the following conditions in order to give life to democratic centralism. A. The leading units and groups in all levels of organization are chosen democratically. They are responsible to the group that chose them for the positions. B. After a free and thorough discussion, all decisions of the group are enforced and expected to be followed without hesitation, according to the four principles of discipline. C. The leading unit or group must thoroughly read reports and inputs of the group and masses that they lead. They must always study the concrete experiences of the conditions and be immediate in giving guidance to solving problems that may arise. D. The lower units must give regular and special reports about their work to the higher organs, and they must proactively ask for instructions on problems that may arise and require decisions from the higher organs. E. All units follow the principles of collective leadership, and all important discussions are collectively decided. 5. What are the four principles of discipline? The four principles of discipline are important to assure the unity of our organization. These are based on the principle of democratic centralism. They are, first, the individual is subject to the organization. This means that every individual member's interest must be subordinate to the interest of the organization. She or he needs to follow the constitution of the organization and its decisions without protest. Second, the minority is subordinated to the majority. This means that all organizational decisions are based on the agreement made by the majority. Even if there is a small group that poses a different opinion after the organization already handed down its decision, this minority must follow and adhere to the collective decision. Third, the lower level is subject to the higher level. This means that the lower units or groups must follow the decisions of the higher organ, which represents a wider field of the organization. And finally, the entire membership is under the highest level of leadership or Congress. This means that all decisions and policies formed by the top leadership and the Congress must be observed by all members and parts of the organization. 6. What are the responsibilities of leadership at the higher levels of the organization? The revolutionary organization has a different type of leadership compared to the bourgeoisie or the feudal type of organization in the current corrupt society. They are not like kings that just order around their territory. The leadership is composed and moves according to the principles of democratic centralism. It moves according to the interest of the whole organization, and not just for the interest of an individual or a smaller group or unit. The leadership is democratically selected. It may be done via a simple consensus of members toward the elected leadership, or if the organization is ready enough due to rich experience through an electoral process. The leadership's primary role is to lead the organization. It watches the overall function of the whole organization to make sure that it is working on advancing the goals of the organization. 
It directly leads in working on important tasks to make sure it advances the decisions, plans, and programs of action. One important function of leadership is to draft the plans and programs of action of the organization. The particular goals of one given period of time and the list of tasks that are needed to be done are normally written in the program. The leadership must also establish rules and regulations on how to successfully work on these plans. It is through progress and plans of action that we are able to systematize and unify the progress of our organization. It is then necessary that our progress and actions are related to the objective interest of the masses. The plans and programs that were drafted must be immediately presented and explained to all members. It is important that the leadership can control the movement of the whole organization and even its parts. The leadership receives reports from the lower organs of the organization, and they study these reports. The leadership also goes directly to the ranks of members and the masses, and directly gathers necessary information to know the concrete conditions. Through this, the leadership can immediately act on any change in the conditions. The organization is prompt in guiding, deciding, and solving any problem that will exist. As a result, it can assure that tasks can always advance. The leadership calls and conducts the General Assembly of the organization. This is where important points involving the vital interests and actions of the organization are discussed and decided. This is also where the leadership reports to the assembly the conditions and order of action of the whole organization so that proper decisions can be made if necessary. It is the leadership's responsibility to ensure that unity is successfully met inside these meetings. 7. What are the responsibilities of the members and the lower organs? The membership of a revolutionary organization is composed of active and responsible individuals who work to advance the goals of the organization. This is different to the members of any bourgeoisie or feudal organizations with loose unity that only follow the dictates of its leaders or who hope to use leverage in order to be offered leadership roles. The members of the revolutionary organization do not work according to their self-interest or that of a small group, but for the organization as a whole. Each individual member works to solidify and form an organization that will fight the ruling class. Every individual member has the responsibility to follow all decisions, uphold all tasks and plans, and advance to the best of their ability. They also need to take care of the security of the group and move according to the overall interest of the organization. It is necessary and a must for all members to study the decisions, plans, and programs so that they can fully understand them and classify how to act properly and direct ways on how to work. The leadership must immediately address any questions and problems as a result of the work. All members and lower units of the organization have the responsibility to regularly send their reports together with their suggestions, observations, and criticisms on different important issues that affect the organization. It is the responsibility of every member to intently study the condition they are in and honestly send in the correct information. This is important to be able to devise proper plans and decisions. It is also the individual member's responsibility to attend meetings. It is the member's responsibility to help to ensure unity and to help in making decisions. Members share their experiences and knowledge in meetings and are active in voicing their opinions, observations, suggestions, and feedback. B. The Committee System 1. What is Collective Leadership? Collective leadership means putting into practice the principles of democratic centralism in leading a revolutionary organization. It teaches how the leading committee can lead the collective. All important points are collectively decided and implemented. Through collective leadership, membership can be democratically represented in the leadership with broad-based democratic participation of the membership. The leadership can more effectively point out the difficulties that the organization faces. This can make the leadership committee strong and unified in leading the revolutionary organization. It is also through collective leadership that other representatives and the excellent actions of members can combine their responsibilities in leading the organization. This strengthens the initiative of every member to participate in making and enacting the decisions of the collective. This can prevent the monopoly of one or more sections in the general decision-making and route of action of the organization. 2. What is the committee system? The committee system is a system or way of collective action of the leading group or committee. We can see in the committee system the sharing of work, the relationship between the secretary and the members, how to conduct a meeting, etc. 
It aims to strengthen the leadership of the organization so that it can effectively act on its leadership responsibilities. The committee system is important and needs to be studied and effectively put into practice. This is a way to effectively put into action the principles of collective leadership, especially in the growth and development of the tasks of the leadership of the growing organization. You need to take into consideration the organized and systematic way of how the entire organization works. The committee system effectively combines collective leadership and individual responsibility. The effective action of every member in the committee in their particular duties helps to strengthen the collective leadership. The committee system also helps to prevent problems that can slow or even stop the movement of the whole committee. If there's a systematized way in dividing tasks, we can prevent the dumping of work onto the secretariat while the rest of the membership does nothing. If there is a systematic way to conduct a meeting, we can prevent frequent and long arduous meetings and can even prepare for each and every meeting. We can prevent neglecting other important tasks. We can also effectively solve problems in a timely manner. The committee system is important so that the committee can effectively face important tasks and problems of leadership. 3. What is the responsibility of the secretary? The secretary heads the committee. In other words, he or she is the leader of the committee's collective action. The secretary is the main person who follows the committee's action. The secretary always makes sure that the committee effectively works on all its tasks. They make sure that the committee does not just monitor, but elevates its collective action to a higher level. They guide the work of every member in putting into practice the collective decision. She or he immediately investigates and consults with the members on any problem or changing conditions that needs to be acted upon. The secretary leads the committee in following decisions and in solving problems that may arise. They are therefore placed in a vital position to center on and bind the collective action of the committee. They continually unify the membership. Through this, he or she can ensure the unified march of the members to effectively lead the organization's actions. 4. What is the proper relationship between the secretary and the members of the committee? Tight unity must exist between the secretary and the members of the committee, the unity to follow their leadership responsibilities given to them by the organization. This unity is important for effective leadership. An important element is the trust between the members in order to maintain the unity of the whole committee. As a leader of the committee, the secretary follows the action of the members in making sure that they efficiently put into practice the decisions of the committee. She or he guides and helps each one in their work. In leading by example, he or she shows the proper way to work, but they are not above or unique from the committee and its members. The secretary's voice and rights are the same as the members. They do not have any special privileges, and it is her or his responsibility to follow collective decisions. It is the member's task and responsibility to support and help the secretary. This is done with respect to the leadership of the secretary. This kind of support and respect is one effective condition in helping the secretary to do their work, most especially if there are problems and changes in conditions that need to be acted upon. Each member contributes to monitoring any trends and actions of the organization and the committee. They help in preparing and announcing meetings. Inside the meetings, members help in making sure that they run smoothly and help in solving misunderstandings or disputes. They also take initiative in any work and do not just wait for the secretary. 5. What are the responsibilities of the deputy secretary? The position of the deputy secretary is one way of showing that there is joint effort and sharing of work inside the committee. It is one way to give support to the secretary so that the latter can face more important problems and responsibilities. The deputy secretary will do the work of the secretary if the latter cannot do his work for whatever reason. This ensures that the committee will not stagnate if the secretary cannot effectively lead. It is fine to have one deputy secretary if the organization is new or small. As the organization grows, so does its committees and work. It is then proper that we place deputy secretaries in different divisions of work. We can place deputy secretaries to the organization, education, finance, etc., depending on the needs of the organization. The secretary and the deputy secretary compose the secretariat. The secretariat effectively leads the everyday actions of the committees. The secretariat does not differ from the leadership, nor is it above a committee. 6. What needs to be considered to make sure that meetings run smoothly? 
Meetings are an important part of committee action. This is where decisions are made on what to do in advancing the goals of the organization. In meetings, the committee collectively discuss making decisions, plans, and programs of action. Meetings give life to the collective leadership and the unity of the committee. It is the committee's task to set up and follow a system of meetings. Meetings ought to be scheduled regularly by the committee. Avoid conducting meetings that happen too often. The higher organ tasks in the committee can estimate how often the organization will assess work, prepare reports, program and plan, and other things that need to be done. We must also avoid long meetings. This can happen if our organization seldom meets, if meetings are not adequately prepared and or effectively led. If needed, we can also conduct special meetings. It is in these special meetings that we need to decide on issues that spring up and need to be solved immediately. Make sure that the members have extended notice of the meeting. Make sure that the members know what the meeting is about so that they can prepare things that are vital to the meetings and can assure their attendance. Ensure the preparation for the meeting. Make an agenda or list of things to discuss. And let the members know what reports, investigations, and readings they need to do to prepare. Meetings can start with initial discussions on what the meeting is about. Preparing the place to meet, security, food, etc. is also a vital part of the preparation. In conducting meetings, we need to make sure that we immediately center on the primary issue or agenda point. We need to avoid dwelling too much on minor issues or matters that are not important. In putting the spotlight on important discussions, we can ensure that the meeting will finish on time and we will have fruitful results. Make sure that there is equal participation of the members and avoid the monopoly of the few during discussions. Always summarize the flow of discussion so that everybody will know what level of the meeting has been achieved. 7. How does the committee continually improve its collective action? To strengthen the committee's collective action, we need to cultivate and develop solidarity, mutual understanding, and sharing of work among the members. This will develop trust with each other, remove individualism, and will help the collective leadership in performing its tasks. Developing a common language is also vital among the members. We can form common understanding in meetings through collective discussions and studies and the continuous exchange of information. This will develop understanding and unity among the members. We also need to cultivate the openness of the members between each other. Instead of hiding things, we need to put to the forefront any problems or difficulties that need to be discussed among comrades. We don't have to wait for meetings to convey what we think or our problems or positions on important matters. Silence inside the meeting or in front of leadership will be counterproductive. Talking or criticizing outside of meetings will also sow intrigue and disunity. We need to unite with our collective and learn to behave even if we are not comfortable with our comrades. Forming small groups, cliques, or a barcada system will also weaken and decay the unity of the committee. We need to be helpful towards our comrades. We need to guard ourselves on anything that will destroy the unity of the collective action of the committee. C. The Committee's Method of Work 1. What is the importance of the committee's correct method of work? It is not enough that the committee will just form decisions on how to do things. It needs to do things the right way and manner to ensure that these decisions will be followed and done properly and accordingly. Problems can still occur even if proper decisions were made if we do not give importance on the correct manner on how to engage in implementing these decisions. There are already proven and established ways of committee work so that we can effectively lead the masses. 2. What does it mean that the secretary of the committee needs to excel and work like a squad leader? We can compare the committee to a squad of a people's army and the secretary to a squad leader. To enable the secretary to effectively do his or her work, the committee must trust the members of the squad and give way to how they work and meet their responsibilities. To become an excellent squad leader, one must be painstakingly diligent in their duties and must be deep in investigation. They will find it difficult to lead their squad if they do not perform propaganda and organizing work to the squad members, if not learning to advance the relationship with them, or if not studying how to conduct the meeting appropriately. It is extremely important to be understanding and supportive of one another, as well as maintaining strict honesty among the secretary and the members of the committee. 
This ensures a unity and movement of the squad, which is the basis of an effective leadership towards the masses. 3. What does lay all problems out on the table mean? If any problem or difficulty arises, a meeting needs to be called immediately to lay all problems out on the table, to discuss and derive competent decisions to solve the problem. If there is an existing problem and it is not laid out on the table, it can become a hindrance in facilitating tasks and responsibilities. If there is an existing problem and you fail to lay it out on the table for a thorough discussion in search of a solution, this will hinder the execution of duties and tasks. This is not just the squad leader's work, but the work of all the members of the committee. Talking behind other people's backs won't help to change the situation and can even add to the problem by causing confusion and making it worse. 4. What does exchange of information mean? Exchange of information means that the committee members must give reports to each other and exchange views on issues that catch their attention. This is important to advance one common language. Committee members must have a basic understanding of revolutionary theories and the National Democratic Revolutionary Line. This is one sure way for easy understanding and making a unified view on issues that may arise while performing tasks. 5. Why is it important to be patient and to listen to the opinions and views of those at the lower levels and of the masses? Comrades need to have excellent listening skills to the voices of those at the lower levels and of the masses. The decisions we make need to mirror these voices, which will ensure to us that we will receive support from such decisions. In addition, they will feel that they are part of the decision-making process, and we can show them how real democracy works. We should not be ashamed to ask the opinion of those at the lower levels. We must not pretend to know what we do not know. This does not lessen our prestige, but on the other hand, increases it. We also should not hastily agree or disagree on things that are being told to us at the lower levels. What they tell us will either be right or wrong, and we need to analyze it properly. In addition, we need to be skillful in handling the clashing of ideas and to be able to patiently clarify in order that the correct thought will stand out. This way, we can form stronger unity between the leaders and members according to what is correct and what can help to advance the revolution. 6. What does learn to play the piano mean? We use ten fingers to play the piano. To make a good melody, these ten fingers don't just hit the keys, but need to move with a clear pattern and coordination. It is not going to work if you use only some fingers while neglecting the others. The committee does not face just one task, but a myriad of tasks. But just like playing the piano, the committee needs to have proper form and coordination to face these various tasks in order to effectively implement them. To do this, the committee needs to handle its main function at a given time. This is important, for the main function is the one that directs proper direction to smaller tasks. In addition, we need to clearly determine priorities at any given time to work on things that need to be done first. Problems may arise while we are in the process of doing these tasks. We cannot just ignore this. We need to determine the primary problem at any given time and try to solve it. Solving the primary problem will give way to properly resolving other smaller problems. This way, we can do our tasks smoothly, and we can say that we excel in playing the piano. 7. What does hold tightly to our primary tasks mean? To hold tightly to our primary tasks means that we need to give our total attention and work to our primary tasks to ensure that we do them in the proper time. We will fail in our work if we do not focus our attention on our primary tasks. Just like anything that we put in an open palm, it will only take a short time before it falls. We can also lose possession of anything if we hold it loosely in our hands. No advancement will happen if we do not do our tasks and if we do not hold our tasks tightly. 8. What do we mean by to excel in numbers? Excelling in numbers means that we need to give particular attention to the quantitative aspect of things or problems and make basic quantitative analysis. We can shape the quality of one's quantity, and there is no quality if there's no quantity. We deal with the quantitative aspect of things in our daily tasks. If we do not excel in numbers, we don't give attention to the quantitative aspect of these tasks like statistics, primary percentages, quantitative deadlines that give it quality. These can bring mistakes in our work. 
For example, in our mass movement, we need to make proper investigation and analysis of the number of our active supporters, the neutral middle forces, and those who are our enemy. We must not subjectively decide on the problem without concrete basis. This way, we can easily see the conditions of our tasks and make proper plans to advance their course. 9. What is the meaning of give announcement to meetings? To give announcement to meetings means that we need to give timely warning before we hold meetings. We also need to let those who can attend know what the meeting is about, what are the things that we will be discussing. We also need to do proper preparation in making reports and drafting of resolutions and the place of the meeting and all the logistics that go with it. Meetings will not run smoothly and time will be lost if we do not properly give announcement to the meeting. 10. What does fewer and better troops and simpler administration mean? It means that our sentences, speeches, articles, and resolutions must be made short and direct to the point. Meetings also need to be short and concise. The key to this is proper preparation for the meeting so that we do not lose any valuable time and that the meeting will be more fruitful. 11. Why should we unite and cooperate with comrades who do not share our same ideas? It's unavoidable that there will be differences in opinion within our ranks on matters that arise. This is because we came from different places and we have different experiences. We must not only excel in uniting with comrades who share our opinion, but also in uniting with those who have a variety of views. This should also be our attitude to comrades who make serious mistakes. We should not resent them and separate them from ourselves. We must prepare to unite with them in performing tasks. Differences in opinion needs to be resolved by conducting criticism and self-criticism. In resolving these differences, we need to always think of the interest of the revolution and of the broad masses, not our self-interests. In conducting criticism and self-criticism, we need to start with a yearning to unite and advance what is right and elevate our unity to a higher level by sifting through the various ideas and finding out what is accurate. 12. Why do we need to be guarded against arrogance? We need to be guarded against arrogance, especially the leadership, to be able to maintain our principles and the unity in our ranks. Those who did not commit any mistakes and advance a lot of victories must not become vain. It is important that we remain humble. We also need to be guarded against lifting our own chair and excessive praise of oneself in relation to the victories achieved. We need to maintain the principle of living simply and working hard. Arrogance affects comrades who become vain. Often, this comrade will have the tendency to become complacent, clumsy with decisions, and be quick in doing their task, thinking that they will not make mistakes. In meetings, she or he may think that they are always right, and close their mind in listening and learning from others. 13. Why is it important to draw a line of difference on how we look at things? This teaches us that we need to grasp the law of contradiction and look at different things as a whole, not just one one-sidedly. This is important so that we can deeply look and understand all things that surround us. First and foremost, we need to draw a line between the revolution and the counter-revolution. For example, the issue of dictatorship. Whenever we mention the word dictatorship during meetings, we immediately think of it as bad. We only look at imperialism, big comprador, bourgeois, and the landlord class as dictatorship, with the role of continuing the exploitation and oppression of the broad masses of society. On the other hand, we say that we need to construct a democratic people's dictatorship, the dictatorship of the proletariat, when we win the people's democratic revolution. This kind of dictatorship is different because it represents the interest of the masses against the ruling, oppressing class. Second, inside the revolutionary ranks, we need to constantly differentiate right from wrong, between gains and shortcomings, and clarify which ones are primary and which are secondary. For example, in assessing our actions, there will be a time that when we point to mistakes, we just center on them and fail to look at the bigger picture. On the other hand, if we only look at the positive things, we become blind to our weaknesses. We can creatively and effectively handle our tasks if we look at their differences. To become experts in differentiating, we need to be resilient in our studies and be deep in our analysis. We need to develop this kind of attitude. And that is the end of Arling Octobista, Lesson 4, and the entire work. 
What did you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comments section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description, and every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. I would make some kind of content even if nobody supported, but I am able to spend more time on it the more support that I get financially. So that is much appreciated. If you like this channel, of course, thank me, but also thank a patron because they really enable this content to be generated in the quantity that it is. Also, engagement counts. So whether you're a patron or not, like, share, subscribe, and comment, even if it's just thanks or good video. That helps YouTube to recommend this content to more and more people, which keeps the channel growing, which it has been doing steadily for over three years now. Every single month, there has been pretty substantial growth. So that's good. But again, that engagement is critical in helping this content to be recommended to more and more people. We are in a time of crisis for capitalism. A lot of working people have questions about what's going on, what's the history of the system, what is class struggle, how do we effectively fight against the rich, and bringing the ideas of the international communist movement over the last 175 years since the publishing of the Communist Manifesto. That's really important so that we don't repeat too many mistakes, that we get straight to the solutions. I think that Arling Octobista is a very good uh, study course in what being involved with a communist party that organizes according to democratic centralism is all about. So that's key. And of course, you know, you can learn a lot online. There's a lot of agitation and education happening. The organization, which is the third piece of agitating, educating, and organizing, that is going to happen in the real world. So you got to find out what's going on in your community, whether it's your city, your county, your state, whatever it is. Connect with the left that's there. The U.S. left needs a lot of improvement. Um, of course, we can't just go in there arrogantly and you know declare to everyone what needs to be improved. But you go out there, you network, you let people get to know you, you get to know them. You see what projects are going on. Try to find the better stuff that you can get involved in and make sustained contributions to. If there is a Marxist group, see if you can get involved with that. There isn't always in every area, or they're not always of the best quality. Uh, there are some other things online that may be coming up in the future. We'll see. But getting to know your left and practicing these ideas out in the real world is critical. We want to stress that because, you know, spending time online, it's a necessary part pretty much of modern life but you do have to unplug at some point and get back out there into where things are really happening in the real world. All right, thanks again. We're going to leave it there, and we will see you in the next video.